turned out to be completely unreliable assholes. Bonjour, Tim. Hello. Hi. Hi. What's up? How's it going? We're here. Are you ready, Tim? I was born ready, Ryan. Great. Well, then I hope you listening are ready, too. (laughs) Hey, we're all born ready because you've entered the zone, the land of dismembering (laughs) horror. We are. It is the podcast shrew where myself, Ryan McDuffie, and myself, Tim Aslan. You've been expressing doubt over that recently, Tim. I got to tell you, you've gotten it right then. You've gotten it right now. Yes, you are yourself, Tim Aslan. Well, at least last time I checked. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, should you have the urge next time, just remember, yes, you got it right. (laughs) No no Mick Brunsfeld, no uh, Ton Chedford, you are Tim Aslan. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and yes, we're here, as I said, on Dismembering Horror, and we're myself, Ryan, and his self, Tim, as we've established, we talk about what worked for us, what did not work for us, bum, 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 and anything we found interesting or noteworthy about a horror film. And we've made it to episode 98. We've been trucking along, zooming along through life. Yeah. <laughs> Tim <Whoa>! shot. <laughs> You're like, I thought we were on episode 42. Where'd this come from? That's 40, right. 42 was just like it was yesterday. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, that's what we're doing here. And today we're going to talk about a film I've been wanting to see. You just always see it referenced in different places from 1960. It's called Eyes Without a Face. So, Ooh, scary. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it is. <laughs> um, yeah, eyes without a face. It's French. Evocative. All right. Well, do you have anything else to say before we watch the trailer and, and move forward? Oh, man. You don't no. have to. Okay, great. No, no, <laughs> no. Something um, not important, Tim, but it's... <laughs> but, you know, just to do our due diligence and correct if we had any errors ever that we said, just like the good publication that we are. I said uh, a few episodes ago when we were mentioning HBO Max, I was bummed oh, yeah. that the Studio Ghibli Ghibli movies only are the English versions and don't have the Japanese versions with subtitles. They do, in fact, have Ooh. the Japanese versions with English subtitles. So knock, your, knock yourself out, Tim. You can finally watch them all. I'm not paying for HBO Max. Oh, I just assumed you already had it. I think no that's way. what we talked about. Got no it. No way. <laughs> I'll figure out a way to test it and see if it's worth. Like, I'll look into what they have and then maybe, maybe, maybe I'll get it. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, I won't. I won't argue either way because I don't know the specifics of the cost of one versus the other. Anyways, all right. Are you ready for it? Our trailer. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. All right. Let's hop, hop, skip, and jump into it. Here we go. Eyes without a face. Les yeux sans visage. Since the cabinet of Dr. Caligari have critics been so enthusiastic. Never before have audiences been so terrified. Never again will you experience a tale of terror to compare with the horror chamber of Dr. Faustus. Here is a strange and fascinating motion picture that the London Observer compared with the ghastly elegance that often suggests Tennessee Williams in one of his more abnormal moods. A mature horror film that the Paris critics called worthy of the great horror classics of our time. Starring Pierre Brazer as the depraved scientist who used beautiful women in the most frightening way imaginable. Alida Valley as the accomplice who procured the young girls he needed so desperately. Juliette Magnel as the innocent victim of a madman's perversity. The Horror Chamber. 
chamber of Dr. Faustus. Motion picture as fascinating as it is fantastic, as unusual as it is shocking. Now, you may be wondering or asking, oh, hold on, dismembering horror. I thought we were talking about eyes without a, uh, without a face. Why did we just watch the trailer for the horror chamber of Dr. Faustus? <laughs> <laughs> well... It's because for the film's uh, release in the U.S. originally, it was recut and retitled and dubbed and released as a uh, the first in a double screening with The Manster <laughs> as... Terrible title. The Horror Chamber of Dr. Faustus. There is no Dr. Faustus in the film. You could argue that there's a... <laughs> could argue there's a horror chamber, though. <laughs> Oh, man, I love how fucking dumb PR people in the States are. <laughs> like going back then. Yeah, of course. It's nothing's oh. changed, right? Dude. Whatever. You know, so, but you do have to hand it to them that they in will get to, in a way that the, the French critics didn't, acknowledge and played up the kind of art house sensibilities that it had, at least. Sure. You know, this just re- reminds me of, 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 I have a correction too, actually. And the reason I thought of it is because of this thing where like, you know, a foreign movie or a foreign director or whatever will do something. And then when the U.S. distribution comes along, they go, man, man we need to change it, change it, fucking make it. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and uh, that happened with the movie Legend that was a Ridley Scott film. And it had the most wonderful, like, fantasy score. And the U.S. distributors or whoever were like, no, make it cool. Like, make it 80s cool. And so they hired, uh, I believe, Toto. It was Tangerine Dream. Ta- that's right. Tangerine Dream. <laughs> Toto. That's right. Toto. <laughs> so, I, which reminds me that I said Toto for Dune, but then yeah. I watched Dune and it's not... I don't think it's Toto. It's Brian Eno Got did it. the music for that. So now I'm com- <laughs> now I'm trying to remember what fucking movie it was that Toto... <laughs> Apparently they were really busy in, the, in your yeah, mind doing yeah, all these soundtracks. Yeah. <laughs> in that like one year. No, so I'll figure it out. But anyway, yeah, it's annoying to... Dude, like I love Legend, the movie, yeah. and spent my whole life not knowing that there was a better version of it. So annoying. Anyway, so, yeah. Horror Chamber of Dr. Faustus. (laughs) What are we doing? Eyes Without a Face is such a better title. Right. Well, I I guess, like, maybe once they're like, well, what if, can we release it with a manster? And then they're like, well, that doesn't sound like a good double, that doesn't sound like a a spiritual true double screening to have (laughs) something a bit more evocative. Uh, what or the I guess fuck the, is the manster. They're both evocative, but as far as um, the sort of B movie sensibility, it's a man who's a monster. Tim, I don't have to <laughs> wait, but it's a Japanese movie. I don't know. Yeah, shot in Japan. Blah 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 blah. Should okay. we add? Should we add the manster to our hat now? Just God, <laughs> maybe it looks. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> look at this fucking poster. Oh, that's funny. Okay, yeah, I don't know. Well, weird, all weird, weird stuff. The 60s were weird. 60s were weird. Americans are weird. French people are weird. Well, that's for sure. We're all in good company. Um, Great. So next, Tim, we want to know per our rating system, how we rated Eyes Without a Face 1960. Would we tell ourselves to avoid it? Stream it? Yeah. Rent it? Yeah. yeah. Or buy it? (laughs) Ugh. (laughs) <laughs> that ugh sounded like you didn't like it. No, oh, yeah, I guess you couldn't see my face again, if you're listening. Ugh. It, was... <laughs> it still sounds like you're like not sure. You got to see the smile and the oh. eye roll. Picture it with a smile and an That's eye how roll. I would do it. Oh, yeah. No, I did. I specifically. I mean, okay, mm. never mind. I want it on my shelf. Is that what you're saying with that? What do you? What do you give eyes without a face? No, I'm a rent. Cool. Me too. Oh, look at us. And there was a good, there was a good rent sound. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's how I felt about it. Yeah. 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 No, I gave it a rent. I thought, um, super cool. So glad I finally saw it just has a, 
It has a, a great, great feel to it all. Fun, mad scientist story. Uh, all these elements that are great to it. Um, maybe it's just a case of having to, to grow on me. or I, There are, it's just, you know, rich with themes that I feel like I'm still kind of um, chewing on and spending time digesting. It didn't. It didn't quite have as far as just if we're. I don't know some kind of touchstone to compare it to other older black and white films we've watched. It didn't have. Um, I don't know. It it didn't quite sweep me up the way that Innocence did. It didn't quite enthrall me as the similarly titled but very different Fiend Without a Face. Mm-hmm. Um, the c- cat people just not as. Not quite as atmospheric in the end or mm-hmm. offering something in that regard, but I don't know. It could also just be kind of my, um, I haven't seen tons and tons of French movies, French cinema. and Yeah, I don't think it, I have really it, I, either. I felt it could just be that I still kind of have a bit of a distance towards just it in a, you know, no fault of either of ours kind of way. Yeah. But for now, rent it. Yeah. I basically feel the same there's a lot of cool stuff like don't no doubt um and it's i never was like bored yeah but i never was like wrapped up in it for whatever reason i think i have a couple ideas of why that may be but you know we can discuss um but it's cool it's definitely cool Great, then we can move on to our summary. Oh, yeah. Um, Girls be disappearing. Yeah. And doctors be lecturing. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) And and assistants be murdering. Yep. And, um, yeah, so you've got a professor... And he specializes in, you know, I didn't really get this, but it says plastic surgery. But I was thinking it was more just like, because he's giving this talk at the beginning about uh, basically like transplants. Yeah. I just sort of thought like organ transplants. Um, But I guess he's talking more about, you know, like skin grafts and shit like that. Yeah. But anyway, so he, that's what his expertise is in. He's very yeah. well respected amongst the community, oh, yeah. of course. All of the ladies with, with furs on love him. Yeah. And and he's got this woman who's sort of his his assistant, um, and she has dumped a body in the river. Yep. And we find out why. Because his daughter it's his daughter, right? Yeah. Okay, there was a. I got a little confused at one point, but no. Okay, so it's his, his daughter, but not her daughter. Correct. Okay, so his daughter has been presumed missing. And to by throw the some na- names into the mix, we're talking about Doctor Genesee, not Doctor Faustus. Yeah, <laughs> and his daughter Christiane Genesee, and then yeah. his helper, lover, assistant, who's doing the kidnapping, is Louise. Okay. Yeah. So, so Dr. Christiane Louise. So, uh, okay. So the, the story is that the doc has um, uh, claimed that his daughter is missing to the authorities. Um, but he's done that because his daughter was really just, what, deformed in a car accident. Her face is all mangled. Mm-hmm. And he, it's become his goal to find... A similar looking woman to t- cut her face or pieces of her face off and graft them onto his daughter so that she can be beautiful again. And he's like killing and his and Louise are killing girls uh, to try to accomplish this. Left and right. It's nutty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Guys. Calm it's, down. So the the story is as they, you know, try and fail to do this, the doctor and uh, Louise, the assistant, uh, they, they're they steadfast, but Christiane, who's just kind of never is given a say during all this, the, yeah. she's, she's kind of just trapped there. 
yeah, she's trapped. She's kind of trapped between what her parents want and this um, overwhelming guilt towards, you know, the, all the, the girls who are dying, the women who are dying at her and, behest. And she's got an old, a boyfriend who, you know, she's sad that she can't tell him that she's around because he's grieving for her not a, her right. presumed death. And I guess that's, that's actually good to specify like where we're coming into the film is where um, the doctor, they're kind of have a newfound almost freedom and being able to pursue her skin graft face because the world thinks she's dead. So now they can just keep her. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, because in the essentially the opening few minutes, he gets called in to the police to identify a body that was found in the river. It's the body that Luis dropped in the river. So they basically, yeah, it's their victim that they say is their daughter or his Th daughter. That's right. So Christian. he goes in and he lies. He's like, yes, that is my Christian. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not. It's the body of the woman that they fucking killed. Yeah. Um, but he's so well respected that the cops go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Facts See you facts. later, professor. Yep, we got it in the books. Done yeah. and done. So finally, just kind of through the the fiance or boyfriend and the police kind of going along with his suspicions and then um, more so Christiane's, Christiane's uh, uh, finally acting out, standing up against her parents' crazy, tyrannical ways. Yeah. Everything comes crashing down. And it she, really does. She defeats she defeats her her parental captors, you know. But we don't really ever see what happens to her per se, right? Like she just we she don't walks get, out. She escapes. We just see her walk out, right? She walks out into the forest, and I don't think we need to know anything more than that. So fair enough. There's our fair ending. Enough. But she does walk out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's a good shot too. Yeah. All right. Great. I feel like that sums it up, Tim. Hey. <laughs> so, should we move on to our first bigger section with its own little theme song here? Yeah. All right, here we go. Time for What Worked. What worked? What worked for you? What worked for you? <laughs> it worked like a charm, Smith. <laughs> what worked? Well, a lot of good stuff in here, Tim. Ryan. What? The mask. <laughs> yeah? The mask. Actually, the it's mask kind of, is so good and so upsetting. <laughs> kind of always cool to see how our films connect, too. We just watched Phantom of the Opera, which is yeah, very right? similar as far as a um, quote-unquote, you know, disfigured face. That's right. Uh, wow. Being hidden by a mask. Dude, this mask is so unsettling, and I <laughs> right? don't even know why. Well, it's so it's so like, uh, what? Are, how do you describe this? It's so detailed, yeah. and also so blank. Right? It's freaky as fuck. <laughs> well, I have uh, uh, so, some thoughts on this, Tim. I want to talk about the mask <laughs> and its implications? This this film, it's got all sorts of fun different, you know, thematic angles to look at it at, but one surrounding the mask. I mean, it's creepy because for me, it was kind of distilled in the ending when she's, when I caught myself, oh, it is, I caught myself entirely projecting emotions onto it because what's eerie about the mask is it's just kind of, it's very like wide eyed, the, the eyes are real, the eyes are hers, but wide eyed, um, you know, colorless, um, just totally like nondescript, but I guess it's some kind of descript, but, you know, well, you have to describe the it somehow. <laughs> the, the detail in the lips of the mask, mm -hmm. like the mouth of the mask looks so real. Like if you just sort of glanced at it, you would think that was somebody's actual mouth. Oh yeah. That's the trick that it's playing on your brain. It, yeah, It is because you're getting two major indicators of, of reality. It's her actual eyes. So you see animation within the eyes and you see this super detailed mouth, but everything else is so just sort of flat and blank. It feels and that, like that is very un 
uncanny and it's probably i mean to use the term that it's it probably pushes us into that uncanny valley realm of of like this is so close to human but it's just off enough for our brains to go what it feels like you're watching a living statue yeah yeah i love it i don't i like it makes me like really excited for some reason because I think that getting that feeling of like, ooh, what is up? Like, why is this making my brain kind of you know, like pull apart a little bit is such an interesting, weird, creepy feeling. Well, my my sort of when I started thinking about that and catching myself, you know, reacting to it in those ways was at the ending when she's uh, the big ending. She's like when she's freeing the animals, the dogs and the doves and escaping herself and the way she's kind of going about with her escape from, you know, stabbing the assistant woman and all that. Oh, yeah. um, it's her her face, the, the mask, excuse me, and maybe just combined with the way she's carrying herself too. But it's it's just like so indicative of how we can equally be reading um, opposing emotions onto something. Mm. So I was looking at her. I'm like, she is absolutely certain and absolutely confused at the same time with what she's doing. And, you know, we talk about a lot about, you know, at the center of horror is, uh, or at the, the lowest depths of it is a uh, paradox and the idea of paradox. So just that kind of thing where it can just be such an instantaneous, simultaneous, um, you know, conflicting emotions being shown that had a lot to do with it for me of just like, Oh, I don't, I don't know what I'm putting on this face. And maybe that gets at sort of like when we're looking at someone with an actual face, we, we, you know, we're so we've talked about how we're so finely attuned evolved to really perceive the micro perceptions of everything. But on some level, it's just a face. We don't, and it can be, you know, transformed or covered. We don't know. And there, there is definitely an element that, to that it relates to what we talked about with under the skin where it's like as an acting performance when you really strip away and and have a blank face sort of going to neutral we put that we we fill in the blank yeah and like this is taking it just that one step further because we get enough with the eyes and a realistic mouth but like we are kind of filling in the blanks there. Yeah. <laughs> and it's fucking, it's so eerie. Well, she says it best and says it herself, Christian, when she says, my face frightens me, meaning like her, you know, meat face. Um, <laughs> her meat face. But she says, my face frightens me. My mask frightens me even more. And like the immediate yeah. assumption I make from that is, well, at least one is more honest than the other in a way, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but, but still only in a way there is yeah. even conflict in there. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, just like it was, it was interesting. I don't know, sort of stuff surrounding the mask. Like when, when we get the moment, the, the, the section of the film where the face graft actually works. And that's, I think when she says, you know, um, oh. uh, that's different actually. But yeah, when she's, when the face graft actually works like her face, something about maybe it's just those big eyes, or I think they did something it, specific with the I makeup, <laughs> but whatever they did. I mean, she, I think it's well, casting uh, I mean, partially. I, okay. Well, to just get where I'm going. Yeah. She looked kind of equally almost like, plastic or devoid of emotion just like the yeah. actor's face or something about it how she portrayed it it was weird it, yeah. it went from like one mask to another and i think that's just kind of showed that no matter what she's she's almost like a lost cause she's like already dead inside it's so tragic they did they did something that i think is really really brilliant and you know i'm going to assume that this was a purposeful design choice so they cast somebody with extremely large eyes proportional to her actual face who is very, very thin. And then they built the, the mask with proportions to match 
her eye size that are more natural to just more commonly proportional. Mm -hmm. And so when she takes that mask off, her eyes are way bigger proportionally than her actual face. And it we we've gotten used to up to that point seeing a normal proportion. Like I'm looking at the picture of her with the mask on and those proportions are really, really sort of standard. Like everything looks, you know, like it matches. Yeah. So when she takes it off, and there is bulk to that mask, like when, like in the early scene when it's being held by Luis, and she puts it on. You can see that there's like there's space in there. There's padding on the underside of the mask, and there's sort of bulk to it. But it's really, really well formed when it's on to her. Like obviously, it's been fitted to her face. But that trick of casting somebody with really large eyes and small facial features and then putting a mask that has sort of standard proportions on and having that be the thing that we get used to sells when she takes it off so much more. And I also think you're right. I think that they they did a really, really flat wash makeup especially because it's black and white, they really, really clean, made her makeup super, super one sort of tone clean to kind of match the mask vibe when she's not wearing it. And it is, it is strikingly eerie. And they acknowledge it in the film, which is sort of That's hammer right. home where they say <laughs> yeah. they, they sort of without acknowledging it specifically that she, her face is maybe mask ish. they, they say something like, oh, you're you're you don't have makeup on. They like double check that she doesn't have makeup on or something, you know, like they're doubting. That's right. Well, yeah, he says, did you put any makeup on? And she says no. And then he's concerned because he's seen that her cheeks are getting kind of rosy. Yeah. Which he knows is an indication that the graph is actually starting to decay. It's not working. Right. And um, ultimately that, I think, would be the second thing, uh, just going off the, the face stuff, that uh, series of facial decay shots, dude. the makeup is so good. It's I mean, so fucking awesome. When you couple it with the medical terms that they use, right, right. It, it just it seems utterly real. And like they, yeah. it's not, and it's their photographs that we see too, as if they are from a medical documentation. That's right. That pseudo documentary style that just pops in is yeah. so effective. Yeah. Um, I love it. I also, and like, I think just to carry on this, tr this, this pathway here, the surgical removal scene of the face is so <laughs> amazing i mean it's kind of like the standout horror scene in a no way no doubt like, like no <laughs> doubt they really go for it that it's just so good for it's... 1960 for them to be like taking a scalpel and like getting under the actual like skin uh prosthetic that they've put on that girl and like peeling it back and clamping it down like it is it's so it's well, so good what we're talking about really is just seeing the skin flaps as it's being cut off and yeah. the little tongs being put underneath it it's just <laughs> like god it looks so it looks so real <laughs> it's fan, it's a fantastic makeup i mean it really is incredibly well done yeah absolutely um Okay, well, yeah, no, just because we already mentioned, yeah, two of the more kind of like uh, visual horror moments, the photos and the skin flaps there. The last one for me was the other classic moment I have to imagine is when we do get a, albeit blurred, view of her face with, mm -hmm. you know, without the mask or a skin um, <laughs> fake, fake mask, a uh, skin mask over it. So we do see her kind of, her eyes wide yeah, face just kind of blurred. She looks like the the they live aliens without the masks on. Yeah, basically. yeah, she does. But yeah, either, they do it, a cool oh. thing with that shot actually because they they do that um, very noir lighting where there is a um, frame of mm -hmm. light that's right in in around her eyes that she's standing in. 
Mm -hmm. but then she backs out of it very quickly and there is that soft focus. So I think that like the first couple frames of that, when her eyes are in the light are actually in focus, but it's very quick and she backs out of it really like right away. And then she's in this blurred, um, the lighting is coming from underneath her. So Uh. her chin and like her cheeks are really well lit, but she has deep, you know, uh, well, because there's a makeup prosthetic on her, her eyes are even more sunken and it creates this really beautiful shadow around the underside of her, um, her eye sockets. Mm -hmm. And it is then obviously with the white of her eyes then being lit against that. The contrast in that shot is (laughs) fucking amazing, (laughs) right? It's such a good shot. So, so those are kind of, um... Yeah, the very affecting some mask-related, face-related visual elements that, you know, rightfully got to me. I got to say, the thing that got to me most, just kind of in a, I don't know, really uh, under my skin. I didn't didn't mean to reference a movie we just watched, but <laughs> disturbed me, got under my skin. Um was every time after it failed or whenever when they'd bring her that mask to put on just to sort of have like your father or mother figure be like cover yourself up yeah like for who you know and it's it's (laughs) it really puts the horror that this is all about kind of like the parents is I say parents even though one you know it's actually just the the dad and the assistant but she's like a parental figure but um it's like they keep saying you know they're doing it because they love her or whatever but it just seems this sort of like all the, they're only sending the message is the the message to her the underlying message to her we can only love you if kind of thing like yeah because please cover that up because right. I don't want to I don't want to see you in that form right and it's like even though you know there's there's times of you know they they just are able to look at her casually with um with the meat face but still it's like they I, I don't know, they're coming from a place of. I guess it's just the fact that they're going as far as killing other women yet still treating it like normally it's because you could say like, well, of course, you know, um, parents want to, you know, do whatever they can to sort of outwardly help their kids, but it's the clear crossing a line that sort of, um, reveals Wait, what their... part do you think crosses the line to like, mur- like maybe murdering other people? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because like we have skin grafts now from donors and stuff. This was made, you know, in a different, different age. Yep. Um, but, but even uh, so, so just the, the, just the implication of, of obsession over, sh- you know, imperfection mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. like of your own kid that you can't love them. Truly, it's the most misguided version of of love. I don't even know if I would call it love, but it's like it's selfish under for the, the doctor. You know, right, it's his under own the, interest. Um, the auspice of love, yeah, if that's the right word. Um, you know that <laughs> it's so conditional. I mean, it's it's on the same spectrum of being like. Um, I know what's best for my kid that they become like a doctor or a lawyer, you know, it's, (laughs) and I'm, I'm doing it out of love, you know, because it protects them going (laughs) through the world, you know, it's, it's that disparity. Well, and what PSA, if you, if, uh, your kid wants to be something else, it's fucking okay. There's no, (laughs) there's no. I I just I have such a strong like feeling and opinion about the idea of of a value metric to what somebody's career path is. Right. I hate it. I'd you like wanna, to. You want to dig ditches or do something like I don't care what it is. If that's what you want to do, fucking that's just as good as any other thing, in my yeah. personal opinion. I'd uh, I'd like to think we're preaching to the choir, but well, you, you never know. It's true. <laughs> you never know. Um, yeah, no, or that we're you know shifting clearly as mm-hmm. uh, the 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 lawyers of the world. Sorry, lawyers, like maybe aren't you know 
unless they're working in a a realm that they're passionate about, maybe aren't doing so well in the end, even if they can pay the bills. Actually, you know, this is so tangential, but to the point, like my brother worked in a, you know, he's a lawyer and he worked in a firm and they, I mean, they just ran him to, to death. Like he was working insane number of hours a week. And he finally was like, dude, you know, I have two little kids that I never see. Yeah. Like what's, what's it really worth? So he ended up quitting and right. He, you know, he works as a, he works as sort of, uh, what do you call it? It's like, um, the attorney, he works for the state now in the attorney general's office instead, which is much more standardized hours. And yeah. it allows him to actually see his kids. And That's spend great. Time with them. You know? Standardized hours being, I think the keywords. <laughs> there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it like, like maybe what it just all that it can take. I think um, he's much happier for it. So, so anyway. the theme of the, you know, the doctor's motivations being so selfish and clearly not in the best interest of the daughters, you know, (laughs) as much as he may be telling himself, it's always good to, you know, in order to sort of highlight that by showing, well, what's, what is the opposite? What is the righteous path or, or what is, especially with this, where you have this, the, the young woman who's essentially the daughter, who's essentially trapped, you know, what are her, points of reference in her world that maybe have pushed her to go and think, um, okay, what my, my, my dad is, and the assistant is doing here are wrong, you know, Mm -hmm. because that was what was really interesting for me was seeing her conflict of like, do you trust your parents or not? You know, and sort of what other exposure did she have to the world to tell her otherwise? And I thought it was so smart to use the, um, the, the group, it's like a lot of them of trapped dogs that the yeah. doctor's experimenting on. For so sure. just, just by having her giving those moments where we, see, where we see her empathizing with the trapped dogs, like she yep. goes to each one, shows them love, and maybe more importantly, receives love from them, regardless of her mask or how she looks. Mm-hmm. You know, there is her truth, which is why I think it's so important and powerful at the end when she releases the animals, you know, along with her, you know, that's less like yeah. clearly her and the animals are trapped, you know, yeah, together and it's in this not, situation. You know, in this type of movie, it's not too much or too on the nose or cliched to literally have her releasing the cage bird, the caged birds, right? Like the sort of symbol of purity thing Mm. and like they've been caged and she lets them out and she stands there as they like flutter around her which those shots are really really beautiful yeah even though we're kind of in an enclosed close-up space there's something really magical about the visual of those birds flapping around her and like creating actual wind on her hair which is Mm. just like you don't i don't when it was happening i was like what are they doing blowing i was like oh no those (laughs) It's the wind from the birds flapping like in her face. Yeah. It's cool. And it's, uh, yeah, it's cool. It represents the two sides of, you know, if the, the, the birds, doves represent whatever you just said, you have the sort of dogs who are now at the point of, you know, enough of them to kill the doctor are vicious. Prime primality versus purity. It's like, yeah, her side that frees the birds and her side that stabs the assistant in the neck. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Speaking of which. Right. Which to get to that and the doctor's demise. So good. So good. Yeah. 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 You know, it was such a good moment too. like, I don't know exactly why it it is as effective as it is, but when she's holding the scalpel, and the nurse, uh, not not the nurse, whatever you call her, the assistant sort of comes up and she's like, what are you doing? Yeah. And they get really close to each other. And and I was like, oh, the, the nurse is going to, why do I keep saying nurse? Whatever. The assistant is going to grab her wrist or something like that. Louise. I was like, there's like this beat where they're just standing there and nobody's doing anything. And I'm like, I don't know. There's something about that moment of, of pause it's that louise i think is putting tr- it's either trust that she's putting into mm. christian or just a complete like you or o- almost worse than that i mean i won't say that's bad but like she's she's relegating her to a non-threat 
Ex- yes, yes, that is that is really it. And then, like, her her coming down with it in the chest, it seemed like it was more in the chest, and then they, yeah, you know, from the over the shoulder. But turning around and having it be through the pearl necklace is <laughs> amazing. Right, that we set up the pearl necklace covering her scars, and that's actually something we could mention the summary if you didn't watch it. It's cool. It's um the the assistant Louise is um, she's an example of a success that the doctor has right. had. So maybe it's, so the doctor is coming from the place of, hey, this has worked enough before to keep pursuing. So it helps us buy a little into that. Maybe this isn't a total, total uh, fool's errand. He's right. On. Yeah. And then obviously when the dogs get out. Oh my and God. attack the doctor, that is amazing it seems like that like that scene why i could see this movie growing on me like it's just so good so classic just torn apart by the dogs that he captured that he gotta say you know whoever did whoever was the makeup person on this they crushed it i mean it is just so good Oh, no, there, yeah, there's some shots that are, like, mid-post-mall where you just see his face and you're like, oh, they certainly did a number on him. They got him. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's really, really great. I I wish I had looked this up a little bit more to see, like, who that was and where they, or where they're sort of known for other than this, but we can figure Uh, it out. I, some other themes in there that I thought were... (laughs) Potent was the idea of uh, being able to change the past, being unable to change the past and, you know, how to reconcile that. Mm -hmm. This is all, you know, this is all sort of our off screen starting point to this film. The story is that the doctor uh, was driving when they had an accident. You know, so mm-hmm. he puts the blame on himself. And it was interesting oh. because the idea was put up that, um, oh, you know, it's just an accident, Christian. You know, your father was just, it was an accident. He didn't do it on purpose. But then Christian, which I loved, she points out how, no, dad was driving completely recklessly. Yeah. So I thought that was really nice to show and sort of, because I didn't necessarily, it, it was good to not have something to empathize over an uh, with the doctor about like saying, Oh, he did just make this mistake and it's an accident. Right. Now he regrets his mistake. But the thing he's regretting is always acting kind of steadfast and reckless and trying to, you know, maybe think he's invisible and then having that affect who he loves most in the world. Yeah. And, and I think that what we sort of see as the through line of the movie is this theme of guilt, right? Like he yeah. feels guilt over that and he's inappropriately putting a version of guilt onto Christiane. He's Mm -hmm. making her the object of really awful things. And she kind of doesn't have a choice, right? So it's like she has to carry that guilt of all these women being killed in the name of fixing her face. And it's like, that's so fucked up and like inappropriate, you know, (laughs) abuse to lay onto a victim. Right. You know, and like, I love that there's that it feels kind of like there's, you know, two, they're sitting on two ends of the spectrum of guilt Mm -hmm. and, and like, then right down the center, guilt, guiltless McGee, Louise, just plodding along, grabbing (laughs) girls, you know, know, like it's just, it's so well balanced for, for like the characterization is just really well balanced. I mean, a big part of that for me is like, uh, the idea of it's, it's fun. We see it show up all the time, you know, in tons of the movies we watch, but like we're the, the ideas of class in it and the rich people being the crazies who can actually get away with it because they're not crazy because Mm -hmm. they've made money or have status in the world. So, and that just made it so much fun. Like what you just said, how we have Louise, the assistant, like just her playing the kidnapper character. Like, I hate that there's something satisfying about this. Like it's, it's messed up, but there is something satisfying about like the crazed older women preying on like the mm. younger women like well i think i, I don't know what that is it's you because know? it's horrific and and it's a version of grooming right like it's she's playing this role of like taking somebody and pl- grooming their 
um, their sensibilities into trust. Right. And it that that's really upsetting and like creepy and scary. But usually we see it from sort of a male to female end. And we can I think that we can pull that apart and kind of be like, it makes sense in a way. Maybe. Yeah. But it's, when it's two when it's two women, it, it feels like, wait, no, you guys should have or like the 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 evil side of it shouldn't be doing that. It's unnatural for you to not sympathize with this person who is like you. Right. right? Like, it's why that are you much doing more... it to them? So there's this, there's this kind of almost cognitive dissonance that we feel that we go, whoa. And I got to say, that sequence, the, the kind of the grooming sequence leading up to, I think her name was Edna or something like that, right? Um, yeah. Getting, and, uh, getting chloroformed and and then, uh, <sighs> on, you know, of course, getting her face pulled off and then leading all the way to her jumping out the window and, and dying. <laughs> right. That entire sequence, I think, is the scariest portion of the movie. You get well, everything you want. In that sequence, it's we're, like we're so You've got suspense. Yeah, we're You've so got with Edna of like You've got the gore. It's great. There's, it's there's there's that part of us that wants to think like we're already just endeared to Edna just like from her simple setup of hey I'm new to town and looking for a place. Yeah, and, I'm standing you know, in line for a theater show or a play or whatever it is. We're but so, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy you know it's fine. I'm just gonna buy some really cheap tickets. So we're we're so with her with just kind of the like okay well you know yeah of course. It's what you do, I guess, back then, especially, too. You just kind of ask around for a room. Um, but then, well, like, it's, to- it's so it's so much worse because it's the prey, the preying upon the 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 um, optimistic need. Well, you know, yeah, like we're just ugh. experiencing it with her, like at right. any given point, like there's something off, but it's not. It's not the kind of thing that you could like write in the police report, you know? No, like, it's just there's something it's somebody being nice and it feels a little too good to be true, but because you're in a circumstance where those niceties are, have value to you, you go along with it even though it's like what? red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag. <laughs> and the the moment, I mean it was so great cuz like once they get to the house, like oh, the doctor is just waiting there like I love already that. The door like opens as soon as they open the door. standing there. <laughs> Right. <laughs> it's like you heard the car coming, got so excited, right. you know, but um, it's that. I love her side, too, where she's like, uh, this is pretty far away. Yeah. Uh, like, but it's then, not you know, she's told, oh, me. well, the, the train's right there. You're just 20 minutes from Paris. Yeah. It's cool. Um, that is that to me is is a really specifically thrilling horror. Right. Like, <laughs> con- like uh, construct. Well, then what? It. What then sealed the deal too is like how they didn't. It it got solidified and how horrifying it was is by their their aim was as simple as to get her there and then put her under to take her face. Like they didn't yeah. even as soon as it got to the point where it's like ooh maybe they're just gonna keep leading her along to show her the rest of the house and get her where they want to go. Nope, just as soon as they get the opportunity, chloroform over their mouth. Like yep. and it's it's just at the moment where it feels like it's maybe right before she get just decides to get the hell out of there you know I, yeah and like that, we feel that, her escape that's the brilliance of it is that when you we're so on board with edna and we see it coming before she does yeah but she sees it coming before it happens just before and that's a fucking terrifying moment for anybody to be like the moment of oh shit I'm in, I like I'm in over my head or oh like my instincts just kicked in. Yeah. And I'm fucked. Well, it's great because it didn't even give us the chase so to speak of her being like That's right. That's Oh right. no, there he's going for the rag. I better get out of here. It's just yeah. and it sort of it, it played well with their characters as far as the mad doctor type. You know, they've Nope, they're just they're just following check, you know, step 1 is put on the mask. You yeah. know, or step two is put on the mask. Step one is chloroform girl after you've captured her, you know. Right. Oh, like, man. It's so good. It's such a good sequence. What would you say? That's about a 10-minute sequence? 
felt a little maybe longer. I, I don't know. I don't know actually. But and then that it just culminated with her. She was so close to escaping, even though they probably just you know she she could have had her run out to the forest and hide, kind of you know that right. we all get the instinct. But no, she ran upstairs to like their third floor or whatever, and, yep. and jumps out the window. There's some design details in that sequence too. I mean, the the whole movie has some really brilliant design, set design in particular, lighting design, but makeup obviously. Um, but the the outfit that they've put her in is this. I don't even know how to describe it because I don't know much about fashion, but <laughs> it's so cool and sort of stylish looking. But she's got her face is totally wrapped. Yeah. Which creates this very I think it's just smart because what it's done is it's it's taken the the graphic and and kind of upsetting nature of having your face pulled off and then wrapped, you know, you're she's deformed underneath those bandages. Yeah. And then putting her in this very smart skirt dress thing that that she's in. You know, it's like they're so diametrically opposed to each other, right? She should just be in a fucking hospital gown. And maybe that kind of was a version of a hospital gown of of the time, but it's like a little too stylish. You know what I mean? And I love that design sort of aspect of it because it's obviously they thought about it and it's specific. But then there's this other moment. I, I I imagine you caught this. When we see the open window and the doctor runs up to the windowsill and looks over, there is a – this is a kid's room. This is presumably Christiane's room or former room as a little kid or like the attic or whatever, where she played. And there is a doll, a porcelain doll in front of the window that's face has been smashed. I didn't notice that. It is – so disturbing looking. I hate dolls. Like, they're creepy as fuck. But it, it's it's porcelain face has been smashed, but its eyeballs are still in place. Like, they were fixed within what? the head of the doll. Ugh. It is very unsettling looking and brilliant. God. Like, it's just this little detail. It's like, God, it's, I mean, that's, that's great. Add on the whole layer, like what we talked about before of, you know, like, the little, the little kid who has the doll. And it's just kind of like a introduces this this endless loop element to yep. it you know uh, when we were t- when we were talking about the heavy themes behind dolly dearest i forget <laughs> you know what it what it was <laughs> right we're talking about oh um, man it's so good just other fun like scene sequences ideas plotting elements in it like i liked um paulette the pickpocket or whatever how she you have this who's going to be the next victim, how she's like working with the police to try to capture him. Yeah, and then cool. like th- that tied to the moment of the fiance, um, or, or I guess you could say of Christiane calling the fiance who thinks Christiane is dead and like waiting a long time on the phone and then yep. saying his name, Jacques, right? I think it was, <laughs> yeah. and um, just, just having, I don't know, that, that kind of, I want to say saved the movie. I was enjoying it, but it was just, it was really helpful in that last chunk to kind of have this sort of, is it going to work? Is it going to not yeah. chase investigation element going yeah. on? It is the third act. I mean, I noticed specifically timing wise, like when, when the cop stuff and sort of the, the plan comes about is very much, I think it was 25, almost exactly 25 minutes to the end of the film. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, okay, we're in this new thing. We're going to set up the plan. We're going to infiltrate. We're going to go after it. And then there's twists and turns and it falls apart. It's it's really, really, really well constructed. Yeah, because you had like the classic moment where it's they're about to cut her face, but then there's the knock at the door from the police. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) It's so, so good. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I guess quick shout outs too, like the performances all around were great yeah. from, from, as I said, like even just Louise, the assistant, you know, I just mean, the I way she was sort talking of the stand out to be honest. Yeah. Like she's I mean, incredible. I don't know if it was so much the performance versus just more the casting of the main doctor just as kind of like, yeah, he's weird and great. I don't know. It's, he's not doing much, well, but maybe just, that's part of what's so good about it. I feel like he kind of emblemizes like the French doctor who you trust, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> something about his look. Yeah, like he's I can just stoic and he's kind of, you can tell that there is this like wall up 
You yeah. know, he's very unemotional about it, but like the, we get these moments where we see that start to crack. Well, it's like we are I think we know now, like we sense somehow that someone like that, who's this fake visage that we've been taught to trust as this like stern, serious doctor, maybe cracks a nice joke here for a little bedside manner. We know <laughs> that's not like a full dimensional person. Like in, uh, if this was, you know, not a horror movie, maybe it's just that, that, doctor likes to go you know to the discotheque or whatever and like let loose and <laughs> do drugs or whatever like on the weekend sure. he has this sure. other side to him you know right. that rounds him out but here that other side to him is the very very sinister one <laughs> well and they do they do a really smart thing too because of his sort of stoicism and 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 like he seems pretty put together the moments when he's actually performing the operations they just put all this glycerin over on his brow to really heighten that he is, this means so much to him, right? He is sweating profusely trying to make sure he gets it right. And it means yeah. so much to him. And there is a lot of work being done as the actor to have a mask on and just be working with how your eyes are push, putting that vibe out there. It's quite well done. Right. Close-ups on the face and the eyes like that in this movie are fucking great. It gave us, I don't know, it felt very timely where here in the U.S., I know face masks have been common elsewhere in the world, but here in the U.S. where they're becoming normalized for the first time. Yeah. The, cor the coronavirus we're still experiencing. Um if you're listening to this years in the future, I hope it's gone. <laughs> but <laughs> right. for for now, no masks what? are very new. How did things turn out, future? Yeah, but even um, yeah, but um, but uh, even then, you know, assuming it's right, you know, they'll still be normalized here, which is is, is can be a lasting shift, you know. Yeah. Um. So I don't know, is this fun, you know? And so I've been thinking already a recent a lot about recently, just like. Oh, it's weird. I feel like I'm I've made friends with people just kind of in new routines and shopping places. You know, I've got been friendly with people now who I've only I don't know half of their face. Right. Or like right. I've gotten that's used to seeing just their eyes <laughs> and freaky. vice and vice versa. Where I'm like, I've grown this big old like quarantine beard now, and I realize I'm like talking with people that knew me without one. And it'd be, I don't know, it's silly, but you know, uh talking about perceiving just through the eyes it feels very yeah. pertinent yeah yeah um one of my other most favorite things about this movie is every time Luis is about to kidnap somebody <laughs> there is this this music let me see if i can get it to play right uh maybe maybe not <laughs> oh man i <laughs> It is so oddly perfect. It was like a it, like a nightmare, the third man theme. You know, it's yeah. like yeah, yeah. I think we haven't. It's got a little. It's got Hitchcockiness to it. It reminds for sure. Me, yeah, yeah. Bernard it's, Herman, I think, is the the psycho composer, right? Well, it's very just sinister and hellish, but in that kind of like Looney Tunes way, you right, know, right? Which which did allow. Like, I don't know. It was nice because it allowed this access point to look at it as far as being a dark comedy or having those aspects, too. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I love but it. No, it was fun. Just like, there she goes. <laughs> <laughs> and just yeah. in her little car. I, it's so good. I love it. Totally. I'm No, I'm, I want to mention the music. <laughs> it's great. Oh, man. Anything else on your end? No, I mean, um, yeah, nothing I have down, nothing I can think it's of. It's a really good movie, man. It, I, I, I will say, like, it, it, in spite of not quite being a buy, I would watch it again. Oh, totally. And For I think sure. I could see it becoming a buy if I did watch it again I kind, kind of, of thing. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. Um, oh, by the yeah. way, speaking of films, I just wanted to say, this, speaking of films that got better, because they're, you know, this is all in the spirit of where horror movie buds and referring to past episodes. Like I've already said, of course, Midsommar has jumped mm. from a, you know, uh, still figuring out after a first viewing, rent it to a buy it. I've already said that. Tim, I rewatched it like over the weekend for, because it was <laughs> summer solstice. I thought it would be a good opportunity to. <laughs> I, I, it's like, 
it's like a hundred times even better from a buy. This movie is it's yeah. so good, Tim. It's, I like it's Midsummer is incredible. Movie, it sure. is. Per, I, it's it's like became a five star movie for me. Like it's <laughs> yeah. I can't I get over it. I'm obsessed right now. Yeah. Um, and I that's what I predicted. Even when I said rent, it'll only grow on me. I don't know how much, but just to report back, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay, so. Back to Eyes Without a Face. We'll move on to our next section. Good with you? Yeah. Great. All right. If there was anything, let's find out what did not work. It's not ready yet. Seems to work okay. No, something important's missing. What did not work? <laughs> well... That's what I'm saying to you. Well, <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> I couldn't think of anything. I mean, I just, I mean, I, I really only can think of it in terms, not so much what didn't work, but just why isn't it a buy it? And I already kind of said them up mm-hmm. front of just mm-hmm. for whatever reason on a first viewing, it didn't as a whole, like elevate me to that. I don't know that, that buy it level that's, <laughs> I don't um, know why. There are a couple kind of, I guess this would be technical. It's technical choices in terms of shooting style um, that I have always found it to be, I guess it's jarring to me. So, for example, I really do Unless there is a purpose behind it, which I don't think there was in this case, there are certain shots that are kind of nothing shots. And in particular, when you're moving from one scene to the next, in this movie, a couple times we go from, you know, some something something's happening that's worthwhile. And then we cut to literally... <laughs> a close up of a door jam that's clo- like the closed door and and it's there's nothing in the shot it's just the the crack of the door and you know since it's black and white it's just sort of white wall and white door and then the door opens and Christian like pops her head through and we're in a pretty tight close up but it's like it's not it doesn't serve a, a sort of a transitional pro- um purpose to me like there's no image setup we're just like she's walking through the door but we're not even seeing the room so there's no context for what room she's in like all of that gets shown kind of as we move along and there's something weirdly like not i don't know i think it's that it's just so nondescript and like doesn't seem to have any meaning under it F- to go from a, a scene where some shit's really going down to this nondescript image that I it, it just made me go, oh, why don't we just pick it up when she's in the room like and like see the room? Like, why don't we do it in a different way that actually speaks to something? And I just find that there are those things where I, in certain movies and certain times in certain movies that I just go, huh, that felt weird. Like it's a weird cut, weird <laughs> sort of choice. Yeah. And there's a couple of them. I mean, it's it was weird because like. I don't know. I, I I mean, I already kind of said maybe it's just not having seen a lot of French cinema. I just kind of felt at a distance from it. Mm, mm-hmm. um, and now I just have to close that gap and I'll love it more. But yeah. even even it's changing now. We're like, when we're talking about the sequence of um, the, the, the woman who, you know, is there, who's, they have the big chase scene with, and then who's ends up jumping out the window and dying. Mm-hmm. Like, I, when it first happened, I was kind of like, oh, oh, okay, that's it. She didn't just run out another way. It is dead and over. Okay. Like my reaction to it wasn't what it was in memory now where I, you know, mm. just being stepped away from it for 48 hours. I just see it as a, a whole and like her just jumping out the window feels perfect somehow, but it just didn't at the time. It's like only in retrospect did I come to like that. There are just, that was just my experience on a very first watch where I think just moments that I was surprised by, they weren't like surprised in a, in a necessarily good way, but just in a, this is something I don't know how to feel about yet way. Yeah. You know, that, that's interesting because I felt similarly where the result made me 
gave me a, a an emotional or sort of a visceral response where I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> but the lead up to her jumping out of the window did not feel in any way inherently like suspenseful or uh, thrilling or like I wasn't I, I didn't feel that sort of. Uh, what is the word for this? The, um... Well, it felt like we were kind of still mid-chase, you know? But the even even within the chase... Oh, God, there is a moment that kind of encapsulates this. I didn't feel the intensity of the chase. Like, I didn't feel like, oh, fuck, she's gonna get caught. And part of it may be, there's a shot of the doctor, he's very kind of like, whatever about it. Mm -hmm. And like, he walks through the hallway like you would be walking, you know, casually from room to room any other time in your life. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like, he's not chasing her. He's not like after her. There's no like, there's no thrilling suspense or tension of like, is she gonna get caught? It's not depicted in that way. And I think that kind of undercut those po- moments that potentially could have been really fucking intense. And, you know, maybe that's just a stylistic sort of thing that it feels scarier in, in the minds of the, the director to have it be that kind of n- non-heightened thing for the, the professor. He's like, I got, you know, whatever. Yeah. But I wanted to feel visually and viscerally more what she is feeling in that moment and it just it it isn't there right i feel like that's again like I, it's the kind of thing though now that i know what it is i will be experiencing yeah. it like in yeah. a way that's uh and i'm sure intended but like why is it that like what is it that we're f- seeing or like the style of a thing i'm trying to think of a good example of like when somebody's in real, real trouble, and we're like, "Oh fuck! I hope she gets away." But that <laughs> doesn't happen here. So, what's the difference? I don't in know. The filming style. I think it's maybe like not so much in the filming style, but just that once she is in the house and can't make it outside, we don't really have much of a sort of um, a give and take of her escape. It's just kind of this. All right, she can't make it outside, so then she just runs and jumps out the top. It, there wasn't like yeah, a You're right. <laughs> there's there's a complete lack of adversity within her trying to get away. Yeah. Right. So for example, she doesn't go running up to a door and it's locked. Like she tries the door and she's like, ah it's shit, it's locked. Goes to another one. Ah shit, this one's locked too. Gets to the third one. Oh, this one opens. Okay, great. Now what? Like, so there's no sort of progressive like Trip trials and tribulations of the of the escape, right? And I think that when you add, if you had added that, I think I would have been much more like on the edge of your seat. But is that just our language of having exactly. grown up on like horror films from the eighties and onwards? Right. That's like, what I'm wondering. You know, isn't... so could, is it possible that back in the in 1960 when this was filmed, that this version was just as edge of your seat invoking or evoking not invoking uh as those things are to us now because like i I don't know maybe in in reading it now you know trying to separate myself from the reaction i think it's super cool it's impactful just the idea of no there's none of that she's terrified so she Mm -hmm. just freaking runs out the window and dies you don't it doesn't need to be more complicated you know and there's almost this kind of harshness and and uh in that 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 suddenness that it happens. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, to say the least, I'm not sure. I mean, it's sort of from a, a, a kind of, I guess, sort of a self, is it selfish? A, A very specific of the time point of view. It doesn't work for me because it's not doing a thing that I want, but that's very self serving, I guess, to say (laughs) that. Um, but it doesn't I, – I don't think it's hurting the movie. It's just it's it's just different than the expectation that we maybe are, are projecting onto a thing we're watching for the first time. Yes. Well, 
And beyond we, that. Yeah. So that is, that is almost what we're talking about. You know, we're just trying to put something in the section, but feels almost more <laughs> right. things of note. So should we move into I that? Know, I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Things of note. Things of note! <laughs> this should be interesting. I just want to get out of the way. And if um, you haven't seen the French movie Martyrs, please skip ahead or uh, <laughs> plug your ears. Right. Um, as far as some similarities. But it just cracked me up, Tim, like the similarity and connection. Like, what is it with French movies where you have French horror movies, rich French people with large tiled underground labs used for skin <laughs> removal and torture? <laughs> well, <I laughs> what would, is it with the? I would venture to say that Martyrs was influenced by this movie <laughs> rather than it being indicative of a culture. <laughs> 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 right but it's just funny right how it's like it. yeah yeah i was like here we go again um cool so as i said at the I mentioned this at the beginning but it was interesting to hear french critics sounded pretty conflicted in how to respond to eyes without a face when it came out where it was you had some people there there was this um there was this tension between wanting wanting to see its artistic merits and relegating, oh, it's just a horror film, so it can't have those merits. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it just seemed, it didn't get a, a huge, it was kind of, yeah, it didn't get a good response on its release at the time because of that. But then it was just, I don't know, it's just interesting to see any movie that kind of is um, gonna, gonna challenge people uh, just to see how that plays out and is a good thing in the end, that challenging, you know, that the yeah. way it challenges people. I mean, I bet this movie fucked people up. Oh, it did. Yeah. Can you imagine? Like, dude, just, it's so extreme even for now. That's And that's why, too. That's why they're kind of just like, oh, this isn't anything worthwhile. Yeah. This is just gross. Oh, man. They're wrong. It's awesome. <laughs> right? But they also <laughs> feel that. And you had a couple who were, you know, speaking that side, too. Yeah. Yeah. I just looked up the makeup artist. His name's George's. Klein and he did a bunch of stuff but like nothing that we're like whoa oh of course it's that guy I mean he's a yeah. French guy he <laughs> did the Hunchback of Notre Dame from 56 which has mm. got some really good makeup in it as well and I'm sure all these other ones he <laughs> like have good makeup but I don't know I don't recognize any of them so know, um, whatever uh, two of the screenwriters who worked in pairs they worked with uh, Hitchcock and oh cool uh, did the film, wrote the film, uh, which is in our list. I haven't seen Diabol Diabolique. Oh, I think the, it's called. the OG. Yeah. You said you've cool. seen that, right? I I have seen the remake for sure. And okay. I think that I watched the original and I just don't, I'm pretty sure I watched the original. Well, maybe we'll pull it and be amazed. Cool. Um, yeah, I already mentioned there is retitled Horror Chamber of Dr. Faustus. <laughs> so uh, it was cool. I was watching, um, this found a couple places, but the director, George Fr Frenju, I'm sorry, I don't know how to speak French or pronounce French Oh, do you things. want me to do it? Because I'm, I'm yes. you know, part French. <clears throat> <clears throat> the director is. <clears throat> George Frenju. George Frenju. Uh, I don't he, know French at all, by the way. He he had made a documentary that was like um, I didn't get to watch it. It's it's uh, I want to. It's like just twenty minutes um, about like a, a slaughterhouse and mm. just kind of doing a documentary on that. Exciting. And uh, then this was his his movie. After that, they you know saw that and paired him up this for whatever reason. But nice. it was interesting. He was kind of given the marching orders from the producer. Said, okay, well for the no for the French censors there can't be any blood. For the English <laughs> censors there can't be any animal torture. And for the German censors there can't be any mad doctors. Yet this was a film about like Those a mad doctor. Things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> so can you imagine being given this? Yeah, so is this disconnect. Imagine being given the script, the story, and then being told that. So it was just kind of, I don't know, uh, said something about the ridiculousness of censorship and the sense of like, you can do it, but you can't do it. 
like God, that's annoying. <laughs> whatever that so annoying arbitrary line may be, it's like that. I'll know it when I see it. You know, classic thing. Yeah. Um, um a, a couple of things that I thought were really interesting about the mask itself. Mm-hmm. Um, in there's I found one color picture of filming, and the lips are painted red on the mask. And I wonder if that detail in black and white gives just a little bit of shading to them that like gives us a little more sense of them potentially being real. Yeah. And then also the mask is more of a rubbery texture. It's not a solid like stiff thing. It's got sort of uh, it's rubbery. Oh, weird. You, no- you notice it. In- there's a couple moments in the movie when she she's like actually talking and you see the mask kind of the mouth is just kind of moving. And then there's a point when she's breathing heavily and you can see the cheeks of the mask inflating and sucking in. Cool. So it's got, you know, it's pliable. Yeah. And I, I- wonder if maybe there's something to that, like how that translated visually that is also adding to that sense of weirdness. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, in the same uh, interview I was watching with the director, some interesting, I don't know, an interesting perspective on what's scary in film and what, yeah, what, what scares, what's horrifying. He said the scariest film that he's seen was Georges said uh, was a medical surgery film because it wasn't supposed to be scary. <laughs> so yeah. so it was just interesting to hear that, you know, we were talking about horror films, da, 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 and to think that what's actually scary is, this is why I make, I don't know, kind of way why David Lynch movies, you know, might, might disturb is when you see something where there's a, there's nothing that's supposed to be scary about this, but it is. And how do you intend, you can't, I guess there's that paradox in it. You can't intentionally do that. Like the fact that a film made just for medical purposes was the thing that was the scariest film for him, you know? Um, but yeah. he said he, the way he was describing it was just like this, seeing the color of the skull and the skin and like, it was a tumor removal, seeing the tumor Ooh. come out. But he said, yeah, he kind of got to the point was that, the viewers suffering by watching this was not shared with the subject. Like whoever was being, whoever the subject was that the surgery was being done to, I guess was very like lighthearted about it or, you know, didn't feel any of the pain. Like, you know, it's just (laughs) lighthearted. Yeah. That's what he said. Whatever. No big, no big deal. Just seem like this tumor removed. It's all good guys. (laughs) Yeah. It was weird. I couldn't picture exactly what he meant by that, (laughs) but you know, wasn't maybe more to the point, wasn't feeling pain during it. You know, the brain isn't receiving pain during it. So just that disconnect that, we're experiencing this horror that the subject isn't at all for him. Something in that got at the definition of what is the most horrifying. Cool. Thing. Interesting. Yeah. Um, anything else you have? I do not have anything else. Well, last kind of related thing I had to it when I you know, brought up how uh, face masks are the new thing here. Mm-hmm. I saw some new ones being advertised that I had that I had to imagine out of the way that they were kind of creepy if that had I anything fucking, to do with I feel with. like I know where you're going with this. Did you see that ad for masks that are printed with your face on them? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I find that to be one of the most upsetting things I've ever seen. <laughs> so <laughs> so why Tim? Cuz it's the same thing. It's uncanny valley stuff. Yeah. Our brains know what a face looks like, and we are that we are so biologically conditioned and programmed to read faces specifically that when so, you take it just a notch away from that reality, we have this massive brain disconnect, and it feels like an actual threat. So, what if I got like one of those? And not only is it just weird because it's like you know, your face on fabric and your brain doesn't know what to do with it. But what if like I, I made one that was like, my mouth is 1.25 times bigger, you know, or just (laughs) just something like that. Like, or was always smiling. (laughs) (laughs) I would love it. 
<laughs> just like <laughs> waited his freak out. Be a conversation starter. That's for sure. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm good to move on from Eyes Without a Face to our recommendations. Cool. Me you? too. All right. What do you got? Well, because this movie is this movie and has, you know, um, compelled many a filmmaker afterwards to do things that are influenced by it in some form or another. Um, there's a horror film that is not on our list because I've seen it and maybe you've seen it that has some obvious, you know, parallels and purposefully and, and not, but it's, it's great. It's called The Skin I Live In. It's a Spanish. Oh, Pedro Almodovar. I haven't seen it actually. Oh, you haven't? It is really good. I really, really liked it. It's the first time I saw Antonio Banderas as an actor that I was like, dude, you're good. Like, I really, really like him in this in particular. I think that this type of role is more uh, suited to him as a as an actor than a lot of the other stuff he's been thrown into. He's He's creepy. Like, really yeah. fucking creepy. But, like, he's taking the things that are, you know, his strengths, like the sort of charisma and charm and, you know, affability and whatnot, and using it in the context of a very fucked up circumstance that he's creating. And it's it's good. It has the, the um, adversity sort of tension from the quote unquote victim's point of view that 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 eyes without a face we were talking about didn't quite have there's some really tense scenes in it that i loved so mm -hmm. i would say give it a shot if you especially if you like eyes without a face um, cool watch this one Almodovar. It's, it's one of those filmmakers where i've seen maybe one or two of his things and i've just always yeah. on the list of someone to get through and i wonder see i don't all know their what things. else of his i've seen so yeah. mine is, yeah. um, I, so, you know, a lot of people, Tim, have been recommending recently, like, um, which are great, like the documentary 13th and, 13th, um, yeah. I am not a Negro, not mm -hmm. James Baldwin. So great. By the way, I love James Baldwin. Right. Like Some of every the time I watch him, I'm like, I like, I don't know how else to describe it. I'm like, I fucking love you. Any quotes from him? Yeah. So Ugh. no, that, that was great. I, I. But I, I specifically, since those are getting plenty of recommendations, I see, uh, mm -hmm. I wanted a shout out for me, I don't know, to get like kind of a full spectrum of what these films are about. It, uh, I really, I feel like those are, you get the story, you get, here's the brass tacks kind of thing. You know, you told the story, the history that's important, mm -hmm. but like I way more, feel like I get a full understanding of something if I can just like, let me just watch it. Let me just see it happening, you know, in that show sure. and an observational documentary style. Yeah. Um, so as far as observational documentary style goes, and there are elements to it that weren't observational, but were still fun. I feel like I'd been shown this at least parts of it, maybe in high school or middle school, but there is a, a documentary called King a filmed record Montgomery, Montgomery to Memphis that came out like 1970, hmm. you know, so super close to when he was killed um, comparatively, of course. And um, it just to see Martin Luther King, like it, you know, in delivering maybe the less famous speeches, but all told in that chronological order where the centerpiece of the film is the famous, I had a dream speech. Mm -hmm. And then surrounding that you just see, I mean, you see the real footage of like what Selma's about, you know, how that, that scene where you have the cameras around there and what they were filming, all those sort of other marches, just see, you see all of that. So just to sort of experience it, in a chronological order like that without any sort of wrappings, uh, I recommend it. And it was, um, I think, yeah, good to watch. And it was as long as you'd want it to be, cause you know, they didn't leave any, I'm sure it's probably more footage that exists out there, but it felt pretty comprehensive. Surely. It was a full three hours and, uh, had, an, it had an intermission and it is streaming for free. Thanks to it's, uh, it's releaser, Kino Lorber. So you go to KinoNow.com and you'll see a big uh, big banner for King, a filmed record, Montgomery to Memphis. Check it out. 
Speaking of things that are filming for free, also, if you didn't know this, Criterion has opened up their channel um, for free for black filmmakers. Um, and so you can actually access a lot of really amazing film. Wait, that you should clarify. That's not if you are. It's not if you are a black filmmaker, no. you're allowed to. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it's <laughs> their catalog of films <laughs> is has been opened up for free. Um, yeah, so with fil films new. that are um, yeah by black filmmakers or just yeah related to the black experience. Yeah, um, exactly. Not not all of them, but a lot of them, and including a lot of soup. It's super interesting to see there are a lot of like. Uh, silent films that were being made completely by by black people outside of mm. the, the white studio system right so those can be those are pretty interesting i watched a couple yeah and we watched this movie this film um on criterion channel so thanks criterion channel you rock Good yeah job. eyes without a face cool well tim i want to i want to find out next week's episode as always well, all right well okay then you can how about you reach your Yay. hand into this hat oh i just you just dropped like all of the hat <laughs> <laughs> all right and now 1962 we're just traveling in time two years Ooh. all right all right here we go read it off there ryan Carnival of Souls. Hey, now. Have you seen this? No, I have not. I've heard of it. I have seen it um, maybe, f God, f like 15 years ago, 10 years ago now, oh, wow. something like that. Um, I remember really digging it, and I almost referenced it, but like I, it's, I, I wanted to say when we were talking about the music in this film, I wanted to say, oh, yeah, kind of like Carnival of Souls, but I don't know if that's actually true or <laughs> sure. not, or if that's just some <laughs> kind of like, you know, <laughs> skewed memory of what the film was but yeah. i've been wanting to see it again uh so great we cool. get to do it 1962 carnival of souls that's really funny i almost mentioned it well the hat knows <laughs> yeah exactly thank you hat <laughs> in the meantime you can find us wherever you found us and at dismemberinghorror.com our big ask is you should tell a friend a like-minded friend be like you no know, it's been great. I like just watch a horror movie and you kind of, I got no one to talk to about it. So I, I put on and I put on this podcast and it's like, I get to fully talk about it, even though I don't get to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know what I mean? Very one-sided. Great. Well, I think that's it. So in closing, we do mean it. Thank you for listening. And we will see you next time. Good Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs> <laughs>